In the early 1970s, there was much debate as to the efficacy of dental implants and their importance in stabilizing prosthetic replacements. There were many prosthodontists who claimed that their full denture designs adequately restored patients and that dental implants were not necessary. Dr. Irving Salmon, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon affiliated with New York University and Montefiore Hospital, secured access to a cinefloor radioscopic x-ray unit at the hospital. This unit was designed to evaluate passage of fluid and food through the digestive tract. Dr. Leonard Linkow immediately recognized the great potential of this x-ray unit to record the efficiency of chewing, swallowing, and digestion in patients with dental implants. These moving x-rays were also very valuable in determining whether an implant was mobile or integrated. We now present the original and unique Cinefloor radiographic film narrated by Dr. Leonard Lankow. Cinefloor radiophotoxyla and mandible with conventional dention. Notice the mobility and movement. The next case you're seeing is a completely edentulous maxilla supported by four endosteal blade implants that has been in the mouth for over two years when this picture with laid implants. This is an acrylic over gold fixed prosthesis with gold stops. You do not see the acrylic on this x-ray. A maxillary subperiosteal implant is seen on this picture. Notice the mobility of this implant. This was in two and a half years before it had to be removed. A subperiosteal implant must rest on dense basal bone. We do not have this in the maxilla. A completely edentulous mandible with a full subperiosteal implant. Notice the immobility of this implant. At this sitting, it has been in the mouth for over seven years. The acrylic teeth and the acrylic upper denture with acrylic teeth cannot be seen on these x-rays. You're about to see a phenomenon that mostly always happened, even when we thought cases were working exceptionally well. Notice the movement and mobility of the tripodial pins. This is a case that was in the mouth at this sitting almost six years and is still in the mouth. Notice the pins are well flared at about 45 degree angles from each other, and there is no apparent bone resorption seen on this radiograph and yet there's a great deal of movement. In order to give this even extra support, I made a rigid scalloped maxillary template that went around the alveolar crest from the maxillary tuberosity to the maxillary tuberosity through which I drove the pin implants. I also had a posterior palatal connecting bar to transfer some of the forces from one side of the arch to the other. And yet you see all of this movement. The reason for this is rather simple. Immediately when these pins are placed in individually in three different directions and fused together with an acrylic core, the amount of retention is remarkably tremendous. However, it is only mechanical retention. As soon as the physiology and the biomechanics come into hand, the movement occurs. We know that placing any implant into bone creates trauma to the bone, an insult to the bone. Therefore, the bone must resorb around the pins and is replaced by fibrous connective tissue. If the pins, as any other type of implant, are properly and architecturally designed correctly, then this fibrous tissue membrane will be able to tenaciously bind to the pins. Therefore, they will be stretched during the occlusal forces, which will pull on the surrounding alveolar bone, 
creating a state of osteogenesis. However, these fibrous tissues only acted as a cuff through which these pins moved in function. And therefore, this tissue could not be stimulated, could not be pulled on to, to stimulate the surrounding alveolar bone. And therefore, instead of bone regeneration, the bone resorbed. But the fallacy of this was the reason why we did not see it often on x-rays was because the rays of the x-rays had to shoot through the buccal and cortical plates of bone and which camouflaged the medullary bone. Here's a second case of pins with a full column of lower teeth. This case came out after three years. Notice the posterior palatal connecting bar as well as the maxillary template. And these are acrylic over gold teeth, so you do not see the acrylic teeth on this radiograph. But notice the movement of those pins. And yet you do not see any bone resorption, as I mentioned on the previous case. We cannot hide movement with any of these pictures. Here you see a completely edentulous maxilla, two and a half years post-op, and a full arch fixed prosthesis on the bottom supported by two posterior blades, one on each side, and just several teeth in the anterior region. This patient had severe arthritis throughout his entire body. You notice how he opens and closes his jaw. And he was on cortisone for 14 years every day of his life. When speaking to the physician, I asked how come his bone is not soft from the cortisone. He said it could be possible that the skim milk which he was taking for 14 years, a quarter day, may have kept his bone hard. But in any event, you could see the immobility of these blades. This is acrylic over gold, so you do not see the acrylic, the occlusal surfaces of the acrylic teeth touching. These patients are chewing bread and eating apples and drinking water. You can notice some independent movement of the rami, which are just restricted partially by the fixed prostheses in the lower jaws. It has no effect otherwise. Here is a case as it appeared seven and a half years after the screw implants of the vent plant type, my early vent plant type, were placed in on the 75-year-old man. However, the blade that you see in the upper right posterior area was only after about six months. The blade has mobility, the screws do not, and the screws have been in almost seven years, according to this picture here. The reason why the blade is moving, it was because I placed the tripodial pins in that area, which failed, and when I removed them, I immediately placed the blade in its position and locked it with acrylic to the front tooth. The acrylic seal broke, and the man was away for about three months, so the patient came in, with a loosening of that posterior blade. Uh, it is still in his mouth, however, he cannot chew on this side. But I'm showing this to show that you cannot hide the movement in any of these implants from this uh, cinefloor radiographic uh, type of movies. You will see, however, the two vent plant screws on the bottom in his mandible and four in the anterior region of his maxilla, which have been in for seven years at this sitting and as solid as can be. There is absolutely no mobility of them. Here you see the anterior view of the same patient with the four anterior vent plants. He only has one molar on the upper left hand side and the blade implant on the upper right hand side which has mobility. In the lower jaw he has two vent plants in between his two molars and his cuspids. These are acrylic veneer crowns with gold occlusals. The man is now in his 80s. And you see him chewing something now.
These patients gain a tremendous pounds per pressure per square inch with these implants. The next case now is one of the earliest and oldest cases I have done. It is well over seven years at this sitting. My early tantalum type vent plants that were not of the self-tapping nature. This was acrylic over gold. Now notice the four vent plants in the upper jaw. Even though these were exceptionally long from the apical ring to the last thread, the implants are still in today. I've mentioned all the time the importance of the proper architectural design of the implant. Since the time of the early tantalum vent plants, I had changed it maybe 50 or 60 times until I had gotten the screw that was had more shaft in bone and less screw portion in bone. Notice the immobility of these upper vent plant screws. On the lower left hand side, I re-implanted a molar many years ago which completely disintegrated as you can see. There's three cantilever teeth there now. I just cut off the last two and prepared the last pontic for a full crown restoration and placed the blade implant in and made a four unit fixed bridge which was locked into the rest of the lower fixed prosthesis and today she has a blade in the lower left hand side. Notice also this was before we had exposed the bone to place the implants in. We were drilling directly through the fibromucosal tissue and yet I had the sense at that time to direct them toward the palatal as you can see from this area otherwise I would have perforated the labial bone and the buccal bone since there is a great concavity that lies in these areas. There's absolutely no mobility whatsoever on this case. Now you see her chewing again. This next case you're about to see is one of about 45 to date that I have done in a completely, totally edentulous maxilla and mandible. Two full arch fixed prostheses supported by merely four blades, four in the mandible and four in the maxilla. Acrylic over gold full arch fixed prostheses were the prostheses of choice. So you do not see the acrylic teeth meeting. Notice the immobility of these endosteal blade implants. Notice the curvature of those implants around the arch, which you could see from this posterior anterior view. Notice the ease with which he chews. These patients can chew anything and everything when these implants are placed correctly into the bone and are correctly inserted. Notice the anterior flare of the anterior blades going toward the palatal bone because that's how the maxilla resorbs. It resorbs to a knife edge ridge buccopalately in the posterior region and labiopality in the anterior region. These patients, strange as it may seem, maintain or retain their proprioceptive sensations even though they do not have one natural tooth left, which means there must be some form of a fibrous tissue membrane forming around these endosteal blades between the blades and the bone. And these membranes contain nerve endings which will maintain their proprioceptive sensations. Notice the immobility of those blade implants and the prostheses, which can easily be detected on this large screen if there was any mobility whatsoever. The next case you're about to see was a tripodial implant on the upper right hand side supported by a scalloped maxillary rigid template and a full arch fixed prosthesis over it. On the lower left hand side was three and a half months 
a blade that was unsupported. Notice carefully the mobility of the tripodial pins when his teeth come together. These were acrylic veneer crowns with gold occlusals. Notice the mobility of those tripods and the immobility of the blade. Now supporting that tripod we have that rigid maxillary scallop template which is a metal attached to the rest of the full arch fixed bridge. And if that metal weren't there I would assume that this tripod would move a lot more readily. Notice again the movement of those pins. The independent movements on the mandible in the ray mark can be easily seen when you look at the lower implant. It looks like it's moving forward and backwards. This is just the fact that both sides of the arch were not splinted with a full arch splint. As you've seen, there's a tremendous amount of movement on certain patients in the ray mark. This is just another study in the field of implantology. A great deal more work must be done in this field. I thank you very much.